So about a year ago, when the quarantine happened, I was working for a conservation law foundation um, at a contract base. So what my job was to create a social justice impact group in the community. So part of that model I created was that I wanted to meet with community leaders in order to understand how are they impacted with environmental justice issues, right? So lead, poise, lead and paint and, um, you know, bike lanes and walking distance, access to fresh food. And then boom, the pandemic happened. So when the pandemic happened, a lot of the organizations that I was communicating with, they started to reach out to me about issues that they were facing. And clearly I started to identify that there was some serious disparity between how some of the resources were, that were being rolled out that they were being able to access in. And then I started to work with some small business owners. I started to do outreach to them to see how they were doing. When you engage with the community, to a certain, to a certain extent, you have a little bit of an upper hand because you're, you're on the giving side. I'm sure there's times where you are on the receiving and I'm 100% sure that you, you learn as much as you, as you give in terms of the relationships and the engagement that you have with the community. How do you work together, but also how do you work intentionally in order to create a space where it elevates beyond just direct service, but it actually moves to system, systemic changes. But system change will come by what you put in place to address disparity, oppression, and racism. But what you put in place shouldn't just be informed by you. It's great that you are involved, that you are engaged. That's awesome. That's the starting point. Because if you're not showing up, then you're already like, you know, you're just sitting in your dorm room and hashtagging and photo tile, whatever it is around something that's happening. How do you actually engage with the community that you're serving? Because that's the critical part. How you engage will determine what you learn, how you advocate, but also what you elevate. We all have positive intentions around certain beliefs and causes and ideology. But the only way you can bring those positive intention to life, it's by what you actually do, right? It's how, the impact that you can make around your positive intention reflects your, your doing. And your doing comes from your being. Your being is the nature of asset of a person, right? And, and your being is influenced by so many different things. How, you, how you're raised, your education, your friends, your family, your upbringing, all of that has informed what your being is. But the thing is, at times, our intentions doesn't always come to fruition. Think about the last time you might have argued with someone because they didn't understand what your intention was. What did you say? Right? You say, my intention was to, I'm so sorry you're offended, right? So part, part of this is having that introspective around how are you showing up? What are you doing that's reflecting back your positive intention. So from that, I created a website. So this is super basic. Hope you're following along here. So I created a website and part of this website, I just took content that were already out there in the public. I made, I made those content in different languages that are spoken within our community. And this is what it looked like. So different people interpreting the content in different languages, share it out, explaining all the different stuff that was happening. If it was how to fill out unemployment, PPP, and all, all that stuff, all those resources. So from middle of March until June, I was talking to the community on a consistent basis, right? And a collective of all those information started to stir in me. And a lot of time, what, what I was 
was doing was direct services. I was playing a bridge, right? Someone would say, hey, we have a bunch of people that can't pay for rent. And I'll say, oh, I just found out that this organization has a bunch of money. You guys need to connect. Boom. So I was, I was playing matchmaking a lot. So that's, that's, that's direct service, right? And then people would come up and start sending me emails. Hey, we're dealing with this. We're dealing with this. So most of the time I was just playing matchmaking direct service. So, so I'm, I'm solving problems at real time based on identifying what resources are in the community, right? Direct service. Yay. So in the beginning of June, I started to reflect on all the different feedback and, and, and conversation I've had with the community. And I started to say, whoa, there, there's some serious gaps here. Started to, so interpretation was the big thing. Content were not being distributed in the proper language in order for people to understand what they needed to do to get the resources that was out there. But everyone else that, that were in, in need, they were benefiting from those resources. So there was a ton of resources for small businesses, free money, grants. And I started to talk to a lot of BIPOC business owners and I'll say, hey, did you know this was out there? And they're like, oh, no, I, what are you talking about? I don't even know, what is that? I'm like, oh, snap. There, there's some serious gap here. So the next thing that I started doing was this. I started reaching out to the decision makers, people that I knew that had influence around some of this. Hey, uh, do you know that's happening? Hey, can you do something? And it's like, oh, wow, thank you for informing us. Wow, wow. I'm like, oh, <laughs> these people are not going to really do anything about it. So guess what I did? I had to come up with a plan of how we can take the issues that people were experiencing and give it more visibility. And part of my strategy was if there is a, if there is a bigger vis visibility, then there's an opportunity for, for, for some changes to actually occur. Because I realized that a lot of, a lot of where the gaps were, it was actually systematic. If the state of New Hampshire was allocating funds to go out through different organization to people that were in need, to organization that were in need, but they were not thinking about what the BIPOC experience was in order to customize their outreach to make sure that everybody was informed of the resources, then regardless of how great or beneficial those resources were, people were still not informed. So, so we were able to identify that, right? We identify that it's information and educating people and creating access. So guess what I did? After thinking about it over a couple of weeks, I said, we got to make a splash. So I said, I'm going to write a letter to the governor. <laughs> I'm going to write a letter to the governor. But I also knew that in order for that letter to have, to have meaning and weight, one, it needed to be inclusive. So it, was, it wasn't just about my voice. Two, it needed to be not just Manchester where I live, it needed to be statewide. So guess what I did? I went on a campaign. I started, luckily the NAACP, they had a list of minority uh, BIPOC business owners from all over the state. So I literally picked up my phone and started to, if it was Instagram messaging some of the businesses, Facebook messaging, emailing, and just cold calling them. Hi, my name is Dale. Um, how are you doing? Here's what I'm experiencing with some of the community members here in Manchester. And we're trying, we're trying to write a letter to the governor to, bring, to put some intention and try to see if they could be um, a little bit more customizing in terms of how the outreach is being. Oh my gosh, I've been, I've been suffering. I, I've had to take personal loans from family members in order to keep my business at flow. Thank you so much. Yes, put my name on it. I'm going to sign the letter. So I want you to pay attention real care carefully, right? So the idea was I identified that there was some disparity, right? But in order for me to be like, oh, yeah, there's some disparity. I got to do something. I went and tried to understand what the scope of that disparity was within a greater, within a greater space in order to identify if I'm going to amplify this noise that I needed a larger group. So instead of just me saying, oh, yeah, I, I need to, you know, this is my cause. I said, I got to call other businesses, BIPOC business owners and see what their experiences are. And if they're interested to be involved with this and are they willing to put their name in the letter that we're going to send to the governor? So I want you to pay attention to that, because a lot of times in service pro providing work. People tend to 
to feel like they have the answer to the solution. And if you're not part of the experience, you might have the best solution, but it's not your experience. So if I was going to go and advocate from a statewide perspective of bringing changes, I needed to make sure that one, it wasn't just my voice. Two, I understood what the experiences of others were and then got them on board to also contribute. So after about uh, 24 hours of calling random people and telling them about the letter that's being put together, we had a draft, created a draft letter. And then guess what I did? I sent the draft letter to everyone that wanted to participate in part of the letter and they provided their feedback. And then at the end of the draft, those who, who could provide their, um, their, their signature, provided their signature. Some couldn't provide their signature because they worked for nonprofits and they didn't, they didn't want to make it look like they were lobbying, but they, they worked behind the scene around the letter. And then now we had the letter. And then in order to amplify the impact of the letter, guess what I did? I did, I sent a press release to every news outlet in New Hampshire. At the same time, I sent it to the governor, right? Because for me, it was like, if the governor is going to receive it, he's going to be like, oh, who's this dude? Who's this Deo dude? Like, why am I getting an email? But then if Concord Monitor publishes it, Union Leader publishes it, New Hampshire uh, uh, Business Review publishes it. So now, now you, you got to, it brings intention, right? Like, that's like, you got the visibility. So we sent, we sent the letter out and the letter got a ton of intention ton of attention. So what ended up happening was I had to, one, identify how do we amplify this thing, right, beyond just sending the letter directly to the governor. So I, my, my tool in my outlet was news outlets, right? And then two, I had to make sure that there was different strategies around it, right? So a different strategy around it. And luckily, some, some of those news outlets just decided to take it on their own. So the governor was actually had a news press. So I sent it on a Friday. That Monday, the governor had a, a press, a press, a news press. One of the, the, um, the reporter actually asked the governor about the letter. Hey, there was a letter that was sent to you. So now it's there. It's there in the forefront, right? So when you start thinking about system, system changes, you have to think about it from a greater. But I want you to understand all the steps that I took, right? And that step came from being on the, it started off in, in March when I was communicating with the community and understood what their experiences were. And then when I started to, to see, I, I was already playing a glue, but I realized that it was bigger than just the direct service. If, if there was going to be sustainable, sustainable changes that needed to happen in order to address the issue. And then I went on and started to do outreach again. Some of you guys would say, oh, you already knew what was going on. Why did you have to do additional outreach? Because I was in an isolated space. It might not be the same with Concord or Nashua. So, so I had to expand on that. So I hope you're, you're, you're picking up on that because you all have an opportunity to come alongside the community that you serve, but also the causes that you believe in. But you have to do it from a co-designing approach. If you don't do it from a co-designing approach, then it's more about you than it is the community that you're trying to serve or the cause that you're passionate about. And it's okay to, to, to sit back and, and be the congregator sometimes and, 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 and try to build up as much momentum as possible. Because when it comes to system change, you, you need a larger group. You need a larger coalition. And if you're not specifically experiencing the impact, then you want the people that are experiencing the impact themselves to be involved with it. And part of the solution, it also has to come from them. It's not about you. As much as, much as like you might read this book or read that or read this and you're like, oh man, I, like I, I got the formula. If it's not your experience, if you're not experiencing it, you need to come alongside those who are experiencing it and have them on the seat to co-design the solution. So I wanted to stay there with the story of the story of um, 
the story of of the of the letter to the governor because it was it was so interesting because when all all this press started happening regarding it for me personally like I kept telling any anybody that reached out to me I would say it's not it's not about me like this is really not about me this is about the community that I've been working with this is the people that I've been talking to and then when people when 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 uh, reporters would reach out to me I would say hey call so and so in Keene call so and so in Seacoast call so and so in Portsmouth because they got to tell their own testimony of what they were experiencing. So the image that you're seeing, those are the two kind of um, the, the two, some of the 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 the, the, uh, the the coverage that happened, and then I had some interview with the the radio station and some interview with the, the TV station. And when I did the letter, I knew for sure. You know, it was you know we we had some really some serious asking there, but I knew for sure that. It might have not done anything, but what I knew was elevating that story, it was going to potentially influence other decision makers. So then guess what happens? The, the governor responds to the letter and he says, oh, we're going to da, da, da. I'm like, oh, great. Awesome. And then guess what happens? Other entities started reaching out to me. I had someone from the business authority. I had someone from all these different nonprofits. And guess what happened? I get a call three days later from the city of Manchester, the mayor of Manchester. And she says, hey, I saw the letter that you wrote. Um, we got some money and we want to make sure that we distribute that money in the most inclusive way as possible. So we want to work with you and the businesses to make sure that we understand what their challenges are. So the requirements that we have in place increases the likelihood for those BIPOC business owners to actually qualify for the grant. And I said that I was like, wow, it really took a letter that I wrote to the governor to kind of stir people up. Right. So, so now think about it. System change. Right. So the city of Manchester got a bunch of money to give out for, for, for small businesses. They read the letter and all of a sudden they have a come to Jesus moment where it's like, oh, yeah, if we do it the way that we typically do it, we're probably aren't going to miss out on certain community members. So in order for us to do it properly. Why don't we co-design a solution with Dale? And then when they came to me, I said, listen, I'm, I'm going to go back to those business owners and figure out what, it, what, what would it take? So the city of Manchester, we, uh, we worked for almost two and a half months and we ended up coming up with this. Where's my slide? Oh, where's my slide i lost my slide oh boom okay okay right, right right so we ended up coming up with this so the city of manchester launched a small business grant program called community resilient grant five thousand dollars for small businesses this is not a loan this is a grant right so you ask me why did it take why did it take three months part of the co-designing of this program was understanding what were the regulations that the city of Manchester received from the federal government that they couldn't flex? What were the regulations that they could flex on? Because I knew for sure there's certain gaps and certain challenges that um, BIPOC business owners have that if they look at the requirements, they might just be like, ah, oh, I don't really have the support to do this. So I'm not going to do it. So what we did is we ended up attending some of the meetings between the federal government and the city of Manchester to just understand what those regulations were. And then we came up with rules that increased the likelihood for BIPOC business owners to qualify for the grant. So the partnership was between my consultant firm, the Chambers of Commerce and the city of Manchester. And so what I ended up doing was part of my contract. I said, I need you to give me some resources so I can hire at least three people in the community that speak three different languages so then they can work closely with the business owners in order to help them fill out the documentation. And in the result of that, within the first month, month, we had eight different businesses that were first awarded. And out of the eight, Five were BIPOC business owners. And those business owners, some of them, my team had to literally work hands-on. We had to create profit and loss statements 
that were that that fit the regulation of the city and the fit the, the fit the regulation of the federal government in order for some of those people to actually qualify. So then we completed the project. Uh, part of my contract, we did it from August until December. As of today, we were able to support over 45 BIPOC business owners. And the grant has gone out to uh, different small businesses if they have uh, BIPOC employees. But 45, that's unheard of. For some people, they didn't even know that there were, there were five BIPOC business owners in Manchester, then along 45. And by the way, we identified that there's more than 250 small business owners in Manchester that are BIPOC owners anywhere from restaurants to insurance companies. Anyways, so I'm giving you this story because I want to give some context to you in the work that you do in what system, system change looks like in comparison to direct service. So some of the quick, 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 quick soundbite takeaway. The first thing to think about is how do you move beyond direct service to a larger system change? First is to really think about what is the approach that you're taking while you're doing the direct service? Because that approach will determine how those you are working with open up and how they're transparent to you, how much they trust you in order for them to be honest of what their experiences are. Because when you learn about their experience, that's what informs how you work with them. And more importantly, the experience that you have with them, how much of that experience is also informed by them? So if you listen to my example earlier, when I was working with the small businesses early on, everything that they did, it was based on them. That's why I was, I was able to understand really what the lay of the land was for them. So when I moved on to start advocating and co-creating with them, I already knew what was happening. So when you're working in a collaborative state, it's not just about you, it's about who you're working with as well. So that's where it starts first. And then when, you, when the space is created where it's transparent and it's honest and it goes both sides, then there's shared power because that shared power is really critical. And then what you're gathering from the experience is more authentic to what the norm is. And then that informs what you end up doing. So then from there, you move to identifying patterns, right? So it can't just be an isolated thing. It can't just be like, oh, just this with one person or that person, right? So you want to identify patterns in order to say, oh, man, this, is, this thing keep coming back up again. Hey, are you guys experiencing that too? Hey, are you experiencing it? Yeah, we are too. Oh, wow. Okay, now there's, it's like, wow, it's not just me. So as you identify patterns, then you can prioritize to say, ooh, this, this is, seems like this, is, this happens often. What can we do to address this beyond just the direct services that you're offering, right? So part of that is identifying who has the power around that particular experience. So if you're working with students and you realize it might be the school that the students is in, or it might be the school district, right? If you realize there's something that's happening, that there's some gaps, you gotta identify who has the power because when you start advocating for that system change, you should also be able to identify who has the power so you're targeting your energy towards the right individuals. So as you identify who has the power, then you start reflecting on internally what resources that you have internally to actually bring change or bring awareness first, right? In order to bring change, you got to bring awareness. If there's no awareness, you know, then you, you're, you're starting from zero. So, so you start looking at what is the capacity that you have, and then when I say you, not you per se, but your group, your, your, the people that you work with, you know, around that particular issue. And then you have to identify internally as, as from, from the school perspective, 
how do you how do you build a co not a coalition but how do you how do you amplify that issue so more people come alongside it that it becomes a thing right like it becomes a thing where it's beyond just the media center that it's other departments and it's other influences right it might be partnering with uh, the alum the alum group right because there there might be some alum from San Anselm that are part of the state or the city that care about that particular issue or you need to get them on board around the cause and as you do that you're not doing it in a vacuum you're also co-creating the solution with the people that are actually impacted by the issue because you don't want to leave them behind because if you leave them behind then it's more about you than it is about them remember what i said earlier the experience it's their experience they're the ones who are leaving breathing it so you don't want to take you don't want to take the advocacy or 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 the, the the system change that you're 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 wanting to bring and letting it be more about you than it is about them they have to be involved the entire time and then through that co-designing approach you're able to come up with the tactic how you're going to tackle this problem remember system change starts with awareness first so how do you amplify this so you get people's intention so they can at least say oh that exists that's happening wow i didn't know that was i didn't know that was going on so awareness is first and then the second you start looking at strategy how are we going to bring change to this is this a policy change is this a communication change is this a training change is this a personnel change is this a resource change and then you get on the ground you start you start working through it and along the way you're going to you're going to experience difficulty and challenges along the way but as long as you stay to, you stay the course and sometimes you have to change your strategy cuz you realize that you've exhausted that you got to do something else but when that thing gets adopted and sometimes i don't even i don't even i don't even count the adoption of the thing to be like the win for me like it starts with awareness if when people are aware people are aware of it and they start talking about it to me i'm like that's a win because that might trickle down to other folks right just like how the letter that i wrote to the governor you know even though you know there was some conversation that went back and forth for about a month and a half between the reporters and him, and me but the fact that the city of manchester kind of had that come to jesus moment was like oh we got to do something different let's 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 let's, let's collaborate and 45 different business owners have received five $5000 grant during covid you know how much of a big deal that is to them so i i want to stop here i gave you guys a ton of stuff i'm going to provide a one pager probably in the next couple of days that you can go back to regarding what i presented to you but i just want to throw it out to you because i do think that as as leaders in your school and as leaders i think it's really important to think about to really think about the the stuff that you're passionate about and the issues that you see within the community from from a longevity in terms of systematic changes because once you change a system it, it it makes a greater impact right and and i'm not the one to like i'm not the one to always say like oh we got to go and change the system first because sometimes some of the challenges that are presented like you might make a better bigger impact by addressing it right away but then you look at the scope of it and you say okay what can we do and i think in in manchester there's a big opportunity to activate the college communities to be more involved around system changes the college community does a really great job of like volunteering and you know getting involved with the community from direct service approach right so it might be like you might be working at impal or you might be doing stuff at bring in or salvation army all the different organizations that are around here right the homeless the homeless program like but when it actually comes to like system change there's not really a lot of voice from college students in this community and i think there's a really really great opportunity to get 
college students to um, to put a little to put a little pressure in this uh, the positive pressure that brings some positive change within this community. And so I, that's why I was super jazzed when um, I was outreached to work with you around this um, this concept of moving from direct services to system change. So I'm going to take a pause here and open up the floor. I know I gave you guys a lot. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to open it up. I'm going to open it up for questions, feedback, curiosity.